Well, welcome everybody. ¿Qué tal? How's everybody doing? I'm Enrique Morones, a buen hombre, magnificent new head, joined by Sarah Bella, our producer, and here with Gente Unida. We're really excited to have this podcast. We have a very special guest that was already on, but we're continuing that interview because she's a person that we needed actually two magnificent blue heads to get in more information about what she does, who she is, and what a magnificent person she is. And we're talking of none other than Dr. Berenice Padillo. Berenice, doctor, como estas? And welcome back to Magnificent Blue Head. Enrique, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. So one of the things that I, I like to ask my guests is for them to kind of self-introduce themselves. So when people say, or if I, if, well, I'm going to ask you right now, who is Dr. Berenice Vadillo? What would you say? Berenice Vadillo is an artist first, is a therapist, is a community member, is an activist, is a lover, is a, a person who wants to see change. And it's a person who very much loves people. I remember very well when you said that the first time, and I mentioned of all the people I've ever asked when I've had radio shows or podcasts, you were the first one to say lover, which is great. You said you were a lover, and that's fantastic, amongst the other things. The other thing I like to ask is, speaking of lover, how, when somebody says, what is love? How do you describe what is love? Love is a journey, because we're supposed to come into the world with love, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Or because of different things, it doesn't translate into that way. And so as we're growing up, sometimes it's very painful and sometimes we have these tribulations. And so learning how to actually love someone is hard because love requires you to be selfless. Love requires you to know yourself and love requires you to know others and to listen. And love requires you to forgive and to have empathy. And these are all very complicated things. When we're young uh, and in love, we think that that's it. But love comes with time and experience and dedication. It is always a growth process. Very well said. One of the things that I've been, since I, I'm limited on my art skills, I've been plastering this huh. all around San Diego. All you need is love. And when we were in Tijuana on the other side of the wall, that horrible wall, we took some of these and put them on the wall as well because love is what makes the world go round, And that's how we're going to overcome hate is through love. So, Berenice, you're full of love. Thank you very much for all you do. Muchisimas gracias. And welcome back to Magnificent Mujer. Enrique, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. And we're, we're living in a totally different world from the first time that we spoke on Magnificent Mujer. There's been a lot of things that have happened, and I think your work is more important than ever. Your work as an artivist and what you've done and the therapy and uh, you know working with, with communities that have gone through difficult times, which we all have. Well, now we have a situation where the entire world is going through a difficult time on two fronts. Two, both of them are viruses, both of them are deadly. One is called racism, and the other one is called COVID. And with your background, and we are going to have the first part of the interview where you talk about what you do and so forth, uh, but with your background in working with art therapy and, 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 and working as a family practitioner and, and that type of situation, what type of situation are you facing now when just about everybody you see is dealing with these issues? And, and for many of us, it's totally new. I've dedicated my life to fight racism, but this COVID situation has really thrown us all for a loop. So, uh, so, so first of all, how are you doing health-wise, and have you been affected by COVID personally, apart from the, the situation where you have somebody that might have it? 
Thank you for asking. I think that um, right now it is a very difficult situation and uh, we are all affected by both of those things, COVID and racism. And I have uh, no one who has COVID, although we've had uh, situations where it's been uh, a possibility and that definitely brings in a lot of anxiety, especially with everything else that's happening. It's one of those situations where, like you said, all of us are affected. My mom just turned 93 years old. And so I go three or four times a week to see her, but at a distance. She's at the door, I'm 10 feet away from her, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult not to be able to hug her and to kiss her and, and so forth, to enter the house because of the fact that who knows? Who knows? I'm out and about. I've been in a lot of the protests. I was in Tijuana this past weekend, and I'm careful. You know, I have the mask, I keep my distance but anything could happen. And I really don't know if I have it. I, I went once and was tested and everything came out negative. I plan to go again, because that was about a month ago. I plan to go again to be checked up and to know, because it's very important that we know, because it's not so much in my case that I'm affected. It's the fact that I would be infecting other people. That's what I care about. So when I wear the mask, which is all the time, it's to protect other people. And I hope that they would take the time to also wear a mask. So you're, the people you're working with, you know, what, what are they talking about as far as COVID? I think what you're saying is really important because we're living in uncertain times in regards to COVID and in regards to uh, these issues that have always been there but are taking the forefront. A lot of my clients, I, I think like uh, the whole world, has a lot of anxiety and some depression. I think that uh, Black Lives Matter is a really important subject of movement. And I think that we all are impacted even more because we're in a situation where we're at home and everything else kind of is quiet. I think that this has been happening a lot in regards to the murder of black people and brown people, but right now we are able to listen and to hear. And so I think that impacts people in different ways. So you have the people who really need spaces that are safe and places in which they can have dialogue that is healing. And most importantly, the people that are experiencing this, you know, as a light skin privileged Chicana, I want to amplify the voices of black and brown people and really look at what are the things that really impact them and really provide a healing space. Now, our therapy is really important because it is a tool in which people can process and find out about themselves, but also create a safe space and a respite because being an activist and having to go through racism every day creates a lot of fatigue and burnout. And so we don't want that to happen. So that's one thing that we can offer as mental health uh, practitioners. And it's more about hearing and listening to the people that are going through this um, and problem solving and coming together. And then the other part is those people that have been blinded for all of this time and the ones that are privileged. And so in that instance, we have to create opportunities for them to be okay with being uncomfortable so that they may challenge their reality so that they can see what is really happening and how important this issue is. And so we all have to kind of lean into this discomfort a little bit more to make longstanding change. Well, one of the things that's happened is my love for the African-American and African community has grown even more. Mm -hmm. And being at these many of these protests and rallies that I've been at, I've noticed how the overwhelming majority are young people. And, and I'm encouraged by seeing diversity, by seeing a lot of people of various colors and beliefs. And at the many protests that I've been on, including a, a very recent one in Poway, we go into areas where it's traditionally a white privileged community, black Poway, and you saw people of all colors uh, in the middle of Poway and the cars would be driving by. And I have this banner that was done by Mario Torero, the famous muralist, and it's of George Floyd. And it's a very large banner. So as we're holding it there, the cars drive by and they see it. And I see that people's awareness universally has really peaked like I've never seen before. I was there with the Rodney King situation living in LA when, when all that went down. And I was there, of course, very involved in, in helping spearhead the massive demonstrations of 2006. But this is different. 
This is different. Everybody all over the world is aware. And I'm working on a piece right now about black and brown communities working together uh, because in a recent interview when I was talking about George Floyd, because his brother is coming to San Diego, uh, I mentioned Anastasio Hernandez. And I said, just 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, Anastasio Hernandez was killed by law enforcement. There were several law enforcement officers with their knees on his neck, tasing him to death, as we all recall. But there wasn't a massive demonstration. In, in this area, there was demonstration, but not nationally or internationally. But right now, this is worldwide. This is worldwide. So we have the two viruses, COVID and racism. And it's the situation you know, that we've never experienced before. So your work as a healthcare professional is more important than ever. How do you get through to somebody that seems to think that it's a political message not to wear a mask or, or, or make comments about the African-American community? What do you recommend? Because I hear it. I hear it. And I, and I don't want to be conflictive, but I'm not going to be silent either. But, but what do you do when somebody comes by, like, like the other day, yelling or yelling some comment? I'm not going to yell some comment back. But, but what do you recommend? How do we respond? You know, I think there's another part of this that's really important to look at. Uh, the media has played a big role in giving us misinformation. The media and even our president and people in power, they spin these stories that embed themselves in our psyche. And what they do is that they tell us that black and brown bodies are not people. And so I think there's this real need to look at our stories and our counter stories and a real big need to educate ourselves and to educate ourselves even more. Within this movement, what we're seeing is we're seeing this uh, pain and anger that communities of color have felt for uh, generations. And so we're shaking up the system and thank goodness for these young people and people that are on the line, but we all have the responsibility to do something active to change our, the culture. And especially as artists, uh, we're cultural stewards. And through art and through education, education and healing is a really important thing. So everyone has their role to do this. In regards to privileged people, I think that in America especially, we're used to being comfortable. And so we have to change the culture of comfort. So in order for you to grow and to challenge your beliefs, you have to have some discomfort. And so I think that therapists really need to look at that. How do you bring people who need to really challenge who they are and their perspective of their life and how do we get them involved? I think that art therapy is really important. You know, you have murals that are conduits to other people's stories and realities. And then you have this process within art therapy that is also necessary. Um, so again, we go back to uh, creating these protocols that are art-based with people who have a certain belief and you bring them in to listen to other people's stories. So having a group and listening to the other person so we can raise the empathy so that we can lower that idea that it's you and it's them and you're different than me. And to be able to use this art and this experiential to have an experience because a lot of people who are privileged don't get it because they're not struggling in the everyday. So I think there's a lot of work in that. And even within these movements, we really have to look at the intersectionality, right, of uh, other people, of LGBTQIA people, of women, of all these, of immigrants, of black immigrants within these movements. So I think, again, we have to really support Black Lives Matter because it opens a door to all of these other injustices that we're fighting for, you know, in that idea of unity. Because I think the system is set up so that we are uh, disjointed from each other. But if we come together, then that is a really powerful thing. Now, in regards to uh, art therapy, I can show you some of the things that, um, that we can do in regards to processing. For example, now that uh, we don't have one-to-one, -one, we have toilet paper rolls or we have what is around 
in your home. And this is an example of um, nesting dolls and how you may break down these parts of self. Um, and looking at these uh, doing art is a fun activity, but at the same time, you're able to give voice to those parts of yourself and to explore who you are. Um, for example, I work with uh, undocumented students and you know, we have some good news in regards to uh, DACA, but that fight is still not done. But when we use images that represent that fight and that struggle and where we want to go, then it becomes something powerful. When we use art as a way to process, where have I started and where do I need to go? Then it becomes something that uh, people want to do and it becomes something that then allows you to look at the unconscious, allows you to identify your thoughts, your beliefs, and your feelings. I absolutely love those. So the first one, you said they were messing, messing dolls? You know, uh, in Russia, I think they originated there. They're Russian dolls. And what they do is they fit inside of each other, right? So there are these dolls that have all of these different um, parts of self. So I use it as a way to look at who are we, what is our identity, what are our beliefs, where do we come from, what is our worldview. Yes, I love those. You know, I didn't know you were going to do that, and I just happened to have on my table, my, and this is my former uh, team because I'm no longer a supporter of them, but the Chargers. So I was in Russia. I was in Russia, and I saw this messing doll, and it's Philip Rivers, and then you open it up, and then you have uh, you know diff different players from the Chargers, and they get smaller and smaller. And when you do these type of art, um, you have these type of art objects, whether it's the dolls, whether it's the butterflies, whether it's the puppets, it's something similar to what you said in the first half of this podcast when we spoke previously. That all of a sudden your focus kind of shifts, and there's a magic in the relaxation whether it's painting, like I don't know how to paint, but when I had my good friend Pam, she said, you gotta paint this cross, just by painting, even though it was only one color, and I was just painting the wood to green, that was all, I wasn't trying to paint a design. All of a sudden you're in another world, and you're relaxed. It's, it takes you out of your body almost. It's a beautiful therapy. What, what causes that, what, why is that? I'm so glad you asked. So when you do art, you go into a type of meditation and this is called flow so flow is when you are painting or you're doing art and it's really relaxing and you're excited and you look up and you realize you've been doing this for two or three hours and so the same mechanism that gets you into flow is the same as a meditation and when you meditate you calm yourself down but you also organize your thoughts and so that works on your body as well. And so you are working then on your mental health and also your well being as a whole. Now, when you're looking at things and you uh, apply symbol and you do art therapy, then what happens is that you are accessing other parts of yourself and you're accessing um, that ability to see hope in your life. So this is a file uh, folder. And this is this idea of using guided imagery and breathing to imagine yourself coming from, you know, this place that is a struggle into a phoenix. And what would that look like? Because I know I told you last time that our brain doesn't know what's real, not real. So if we take ourselves there, then we then are able to problem solve and to come together and to have that hope that I can get there. Now, I want to give props. Uh, to Ian Gunn and uh, the Puppet Mind and it, what is it called? Cracker Conspiracy? Puppet Cracker Conspiracy. I'm sorry if I didn't say that right. But they are doing a, a puppet workshop Wednesdays at four o'clock and you should definitely uh, check them out. Um, and so what I do is I take some of these uh, interesting um, art ideas and then I translate them into art therapy because there is a translation when you're looking at art in a way of getting you somewhere to heal. And so we need those things, especially now, like you said, 
um, because we need community, we need to share our stories, we need to be able to understand ourselves and to educate ourselves more and to be okay with, we have these implicit biases because we need to do long lasting change and no one is perfect and we really need to be okay with being uncomfortable and challenging ourselves, challenging each other and creating a community in which we can do that. I love the way you, you move those, like the butterfly and the bird across the screen as you're talking. It brings me back to being a child. Yeah. And I think that when you're a child, that's when you have everything open, trust and curiosity and love and no doubt. And if we could only be more like children, and that's, uh, that's something that I've always um, emphasized, that a society is judged on how we treat our children. And uh, if we could, because we let our defenses down and there's a relaxation to it. I've become good friends with another person from our board uh, who's from Iran, and her name is Adi Honavat. And she does like a dance therapy type of situation. She does these, uh, and I can't copy it, but she does like these Iranian dances. And she right now she's doing them through Zoom with the shelters in Tijuana. And it's so cute to see the children trying to do that dance and how they, the adults that are there, become children too. And they start doing it and you let your guard down. And that's what happened recently when we were in Tijuana. We had migrants, we had people that are as awkward as me doing the dance and you let your defenses down. And she said, one of the first exercises we did was she had us like shake. And she goes, you're shaking all of that out of you, all of the, you know, the stress or whatever. And then she had us yell at a certain time. And it's those same type of action that an artist, whether it's through dance or through art, brings us to our childhood because by doing these things you're you're kind of caught off guard when i've debated and i've debated these crazy people joe arpaio bill o'reilly sean hannity i've debated them all and one of the things that i try to do is try to catch them off guard by not saying oh you said this i said that by the, the humanity of these issues and that's why for me it has been very important and we are closer than ever to have a house of Mexico in Balboa Park. Because when people will go to that house, they're not gonna be thinking about, oh, this person and that. They're gonna say, that's right, that's where this beautiful Frida Kahlo art comes from. Or that's where that beautiful you know, song comes from, Los Panchos, the music, the art, the dance, the, the, and so forth. It lets our guard down and it opens up our heart. And all of a sudden we're in another world. And if we could only, stay in that world a little longer, the world would be a better place. And I think it's needed now more than ever. Uh, you know, absolutely. It's a wonderful point because I think when you do art, it's very novel and it does keep you off guard. So when I do an art therapy group or I do art therapy with someone, it is fun. And then they realize, oh, there is some healing and some insight to be, to be had. Art is really important. It's the first thing that they pull out in schools, but in actuality, when you do art, you're actually making connections in your brain. And it is a really important way of, of learning and understanding. When you look at a piece of art, you're understanding it in, in multiple levels. And so I think that it's really important that we look at the arts as something as really necessary. Necessary as it is breathing. Necessary as it is to live your life every day because it does connect your body and your mind and it gives you a respite and it also gives you that ability to process within yourself your feelings your thoughts your ideas and to look beyond uh, where you don't even know that you need to look um and so i think that what was interesting is you saying yes we are judged by how we treat our children and the the stark reality is that we have children in cages and so that is a real issue and I think one of the things that is really hard, especially for activists, is that idea that I need self-care. And they definitely do. We definitely need to slow down to validate. And we also need to say no. You know, no is a complete sentence. And we have to be able to charge our batteries so we can continue to do this work. And we also need to kind of check ourselves and to really dive into mental health, but mental health in a way where it is not me telling you what you need, but it's me in collaboration with you, trying to figure out how do we heal ourselves and our community. And in regards to 
this child self, we have a lot of trauma. And as Latinos, especially, and people of color, we don't really understand the impact. And so healing is a really important thing. I didn't grow up understanding mental health. It was unattainable to me. You know, my mom still tells me, oh, it's para locos, right? But mental health is really the user guide to your brain. And it really helps you to understand. And when we go back and we heal these child parts of ourselves, these parts that grew up and saw the racism and the discrimination, then as adults, we then can take up space and we could talk in a way where we can be heard. And I think that's really important to create these platforms in which we heal and we are heard. And that's the most important part, I think, of the mental health uh, movement and to create one um, that is not colonized, one that is for the people. One of the things that I've learned, there's five of us in our family, there's, I have four siblings, two of them work in mental health, uh, is that we all have issues of mental health. I've always known that I have issues, et cetera. Um, and especially as a male Latino, um, that we, we as, a, as a male person of color, because I think it, it, it's across the board, we tend to say, oh, oh you know, I'm not going to go see a mental health expert. No, no, no. I'm going to talk to my compadre or I'm going to talk to my bartender. You think that there's the solutions and I'm going, why would I talk to my compadre unless my compadre happens to be a mental health professional? Why would I, I'm not going to go to my dentist to talk about my heart problem. Yet with mental health, it's almost taboo. And I think that the, the generation, the, the young generation, they're more learned about those issues. They, they really are way ahead of where I was when I was that age in being more open about accepting different communities, working with the, uh, the, whether it's a gay community or the Muslim community or the Latino, whichever it is, they're much more open than we were. And one of the things I tell the young people when I'm lecturing is that when you go back home, you know, these students come from all over the place. When you go back home and you've learned these situations, the reality of the migrant, the beauty of the migrants and so forth, you're not going to be able to convince your parents what, you know, what you've learned. You, you want to share that experience, but don't think that all of a sudden they're going to turn off Fox News and start watching MSNBC. That's not going to happen. But at least by example with what you've learned. And that's what gives me tremendous inspiration is the youth. I was at, a, at one of the many Black Lives Matters rallies uh, a few weeks ago, and it was one of the biggest ones. We ended up going from the county administration building to the police station. And here I am in front of the whole group, and I asked everybody to take a knee. It was getting a little bit out of hand. So I said, okay, why don't we all take a knee for eight minutes and 46 seconds? There was about 5,000 people there. They all took a knee. They all took a knee. And it calmed everything down. And then after that, we went back to the, from the police station on 15th and Market, back to the, uh, the county administration building. And I, I have bad knees. So I was like the last guy there. And, and they were, you know, there's other speakers and all that type of stuff. And all of a sudden, this person comes walking up to me. They go, oh, yeah, I recognize you. And it put me at ease, and it was a little bit uncomfortable because the person that came up to me was dressed like a panda bear. No. She was dressed like a panda bear. And she was great. She was a, I don't even know what she looks like. She comes up, she goes, oh, Enrique Morales, I know who you are. And she's having a very serious conversation with me. And I, I just happen to have this panda here. And she's talking to me dressed as a panda bear. And it was really something where I'm going, this is awkward. You know, like anybody else that's out there, they're going, look at that guy talking to that panda bear. And she had a sign that said Black Lives Matter. She had a little picture of the panda bear. And I've gotten to know her. Her name is Rachel. I still haven't seen her without the panda bear outfit. <laughs> and I said, Rachel, I'd love to have you join me in Tijuana when we visit the shelters. The children will go crazy. So she sent me a picture. She's already done that. Not to the shelters, but she's already been with the kids in Tijuana. And there's something childlike about that when you can bring that out. And that's something that art does, music does. It brings out the child in us, which is one of our best qualities. And if we could just continue to go back there. You mentioned something in the first interview, which I'll never forget. Your second drawing, you said, was that mural you painted at Chicano Park. And that here is your second art project, and you're painting this mural. And some of the comments that your, your mom made, and you said something along the lines of, I'm trying to get this ugliness out, these feelings out. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, because I know that when we've done these like 
with Adi, the dance and, and these, these different activities, you are kind of trying to take the negative out, either with physical action or it could be with the action of painting or singing. So, so, so that was very powerful, that statement, that you were, like when your mom was saying, oh, but this ugly, she goes, yeah, I'm trying to get the ugliness out. I, I'm so happy that you brought that up. When we have overwhelming feelings, we sometimes drown in them or we avoid them completely. And what we have to do is we have to validate them and we have to invite them in so that we could accept all of who we are. So art allows us to process, to go into a different place. So in the action of using images, we could create a story about ourselves and this image then talks to us. And so being able to bring out those things that cause us the most fear allows us to be able to bring them into the light and slay them. And that's an important thing to do because if we ignore our problems or our feelings or we ignore those traumas that we have that we don't even know our traumas, they come up. It's not like they go away. You know, we are having to deal with them in our life as we grow older and especially when there is a, a change or chaos in our life. And so using art allows us to befriend that ugly or that part of ourselves that we don't want to be there. And so when I was growing up, that's exactly what I did. I would draw all of the negative emotions and all of the sadness and the anger, and I would kind of like vomit it out. And then when I had it, then I could do something with it. So I could rip it up. I could create something. Thing, and that changes the way that you have a relationship with your feelings. So if you're afraid of being sad, that you draw a picture that is sad, then you can have this conversation with that picture and you are having that conversation with yourself. So that is the magic, I think, of art therapy. I mean, even looking at containing things. How many of us uh, have this negative commentary uh, in our lives every day? Sometimes we don't even notice, right? We can say, oh, bene you are, are going to be a disaster on this interview or whatever it is. And it comes from a very early place. Um, but if you focus on what do I say to myself, what do I contain and what do I amplify, which is that positive part of myself, that part that I want to believe about myself, then you're making change in your brain. And I think that is a revolution in itself because if we love who we are, if we lower stigma and we allow ourselves to be healed, we can then pass that over to our parents, we can pass that over to our children. And I think that is like the most powerful thing, that if we are healed people, then we are strong people, then we can demand what we want. And I think that's scary, right? Because we will no longer be in this place where we're gonna be less than, we are going to demand our place of where we need to be. Oh, boy, I could go on for hours learning from you. and Because it, it, it makes so much sense what you're talking about. I had asked something. I think I kind of rambled on, and maybe we, we kind of went off subject a little bit. When that person yells at you, for whatever reason, you so-and-so, or like when we were at a rally and they make a negative comment, um, what do you recommend that, 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 for example, somebody yells at me? You know, it, it's hard to resist for me not to yell back, but that's not my temperament. But I have, you know, sometimes acted out of character uh, because it does, you know, you, you obviously hear what they said. And, but I, now that I'm older, I know there's a lot of people around me that are younger people and I don't want to set a bad example. So I don't yell back. But um, is there some sort of a strategy that you recommend or what do you think? You know, when I was younger, I had a lot of anger. I, I probably the people who I've known for 30 or more years uh, realize the change that I've had in my life. So back in the day, if you called me something, I'd be all over your face. I'm going to take off my earrings. We're going to throw down and it's not going to be pretty. And through the process of healing and therapy and art therapy, I realized that the reason I had such a reaction was because I was hurt and I had pain from uh, way back when. And so looking at where does this come from, this reaction? Because once I was able to process that and work on that and heal myself and feel safe, then you're able to have that insight 
that that person yelling at you, they have pain and anger and they feel oppressed or they feel like they don't have a voice. And so instead of dealing with it, they throw it out. And so part of it is that we as a society need to work on ourselves so that that stops happening. But again, we go back to how important mental health is and how much we don't see it as something necessary. And it's what you were saying. Like you wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't dare go uh, not go to the dentist if your teeth are rotting. You wouldn't dare not go and get um, your heart worked on if you're having trouble. But yet mental health doesn't seem like an important thing, but I think it is the basis of understanding ourselves and other people. And, and we need to do that. So the easiest answer to that is to learn some deep breathing, to be able to get some, some basic skills, some grounding, uh, so that you're able to kind of ground yourself and calm yourself down because we are triggered and fight, flight, or freeze when things like that happen because we're reminded of other things in our life. Um, and then being able to understand that that person is, is going through their own madness and how do we protect ourselves and what is the priority of what we want to do. Um, so I encourage people to explore what therapy is. I am offering a therapy groups for the community. You can check that out if you go to the Instagram and you check me out at Vivadillos. Um, there are multiple things that would really help you with that meditation, guided imagery. But most importantly, I think it's really like an onion, understanding where it comes from. And then being able to have some mechanism that can calm you down and some ability to be more communicative, right, with the people around you. And I think that we need a larger movement, right? How do we get people to get out of their comfort zone and to really work on themselves and educate themselves and be heard? And so I think that beyond these healing circles, we need a larger mechanism for our society so that we can understand, right? And then we need to shut down those people that are racist. We need to make it so that there is a consequence for those beliefs. And we need to shut that down. Well said. I, I think I've said this before, maybe even on another podcast about that. One of the big influences in my life was Mrs. Ethel Kennedy. And one time when I was with her and we were at a ceremony for Cesar Chavez in East LA, and I was with the Chavez family, I was sitting right with them. And that's why Mrs. Kennedy was there. And we were talking and she said, and I was kind of asking her along those lines about when people attack, no family in the United States has been more persecuted and had such tragedies as the Kennedy. And I said, yeah, well, you know, when we're attacked and all this, and she said, Enrique, when you're attacked, and then she goes, and I know you are, you know, you're, and back then, this was, I'm talking about 1993. So it's not like now where I'm you know, better known and so forth. She goes, you'll really know that you've made a huge impact when the attacks come from people within your own community that you think would be allies, because the enemies are obvious. They're going to yell you this and that and all this kind of stuff. And even back then, I said, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Because she said that with her family, she was always so hurt, especially when it was people that they thought they trusted, that because of envy or whatever. And I've learned for the last 20 years or so to stay focused on the mission. When I get those personal attacks, because people are envious or whatever, I stay focused on the mission, which is, you know, be, be, uh, be that, that, that you wish the world to be. Be a servant leader. Practice love. Don't just respond, but, but show leadership because there's a lot of young people looking, and I try to, to do that every day in, in the actions that I do. And I fail sometimes, but I realize I'm going to fail. I realize I have a lot to learn. And one of the things that I've learned these last couple of years is I've gotten closer to Eastern, Eastern practices, mm -hmm. whether it's meditation, whether it's the, uh, the art, like what you do, or the dancing, like what Adi does and so forth. And there's such value in that. And, I, and I'm sitting there going, I wish I would have known that better. Or, or I'm sorry, would have known that earlier. But then as I think, I would, I think, I don't think I would have been ready back then. I don't think I would have been ready. Now, as I'm getting older, I'm in the last chapter of my life. And I'm seeing all these lessons and what peace there is, what peace there is in art, in dance, in music. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why it's so refreshing to speak to you. And once again, we're going to have to have you back 
because uh, I, I feel more relaxed and, and uh, in, in a better state just from having spoken to you again. Mm -hmm. So what, what kind of, what closing words would you like to say where there's that person that maybe still is too hesitant to go to the medical professional, but maybe things that they can do or uh, to, you know, to, to have a better state of mind, you know, whether it's through painting or, 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 or I don't know, their breathing exercises. What, what do you recommend? I'm, I'm still not convinced. I know better, you know, that, that type of attitude. There's a lot of people out there like that. So, so what do you, uh, rec I know I can learn from that. What, what do you recommend? You brought up so many things and I want to address them, but the most important one that you just brought up is what do we do? So I think that people are afraid of what they don't know. And I think this is the biggest issue that is happening in our country in the world is not wanting to get out of our comfort zone I, I keep saying that but i think it's really important what you can do at home to have you feel better is a couple things you can learn how to breathe and breathing um, through your diaphragm is very different than your everyday breathing and so breathing through your diaphragm is breathing through your nose in holding it and then twice as long and so being able to breathe that way 10 times and then being able to be more mindful about what you're feeling. So journaling is really important. Uh, doing some artwork is an important thing. I mean, bust out that coloring book if you need to. Uh, connecting with nature. But most importantly, I think is community. How do you connect with people? Because I know that when I'm overwhelmed, I may not have the time or want to do exercise or go outside or breathe or do yoga or even connect with my comadre. But this is what we really need to do. We need to uh, be aware that we have to slow down and we have to really check into how we are feeling, what we are thinking and, and make that connection. Um, in regards to what you were saying about the haters, I think, yes, that's very true. If you're not doing it right, you don't have any haters. That is definitely a true statement. But what comes up for me um, is that line, uh, no justice, no peace. Uh, I think that what we're doing here in mental health is, yes, how do we support you uh, in the work that you're doing? But I think uh, as a woman, as a Latina woman, you know, I definitely know what that is, especially as a muralist and, you know, working um, in this field, we need to have our voice be heard. We need to have those platforms and we need to do it any way possible. And so even though I am a therapist and I'm so happy to be able to bring you some calm, hey, I'm, I'm about that resistance too. Like wh in whatever means necessary, we need to, to, to be heard and, and to change up that status quo. And so the only way we're gonna do it is if we are intact, our mind, our heart, and our body, and if we're connected, and we can have these dialogues. I think that's super important. How are we open to have a conversation? And if I don't agree with you, Enrique, that's cool, but let's understand, right? Each other's point of view. Um, and, and let's take care of ourselves and, and be safe. One of the things, I've, one of the many things I've learned from our African-American brothers and sisters, especially of late, is one of the chants that they were saying was, well, it wasn't a chant. They were more, more or less talking about this as we were talking as a group. And they were saying, it's a good thing that we're asking for equality and not revenge. And I thought about that, and I, because I, I'm still mad. I am still mad that the United States stole half of Mexico. I'm still mad about that, and I will be mad till the day I die. That was, you know, I don't even want to get into it. But here, the African-American community, what they have gone through, and with the murder of George Floyd uh, and, and the other people that have been killed, which is so horrific. And, and I'm thinking, you know, they're, they're out there chanting, and I'm right there with them. And they're just asking for equality, respect, treated in, in a dignified manner. They're not asking for revenge. And because and I, and I think about it, I go, I might be asking for revenge if I was them. I think of my Japanese brothers and sisters, and I think, how can they be so peaceful after they're, they were bombed and, and civil, you know, millions of people died because of bombs by the U.S.? I, and that was more recent. And I'm thinking, I, I would be pretty mad. I don't know if I'd be as calm, because the Asian culture in general is, is very calm, at least outwardly. So I've learned a lot about that, about trying to find peace. 
And uh, so it's been a good lesson to me. It's been a good lesson to me. And as I was thinking about it with this friend of mine uh, just the other day, she's Japanese. She goes, do you have any friends that aren't like of another country or ethnicity? And I said, yes, I do. She goes, because everybody you mentioned, like right now, a, a lady from Iran, a person from Mexico. This morning I was picking up donations from a woman from Iraq. Um, that's my life. Because, you know, I find that these communities, they know what it's like to be oppressed. They know what it's like to be threatened and challenged and discriminated against. Not that it doesn't happen in every community, but especially communities of color. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the gay community, the, a different religion, and so on and so forth. They're more sensitive to those issues, I believe. And that's why I like to be with them so much, because they can teach me and they understand a lot of the things that I've gone through as a man of color. Uh, so it's very, and then I've also found that in the artist community, in the muralists like you, in the dancers like other people, in the musicians like others, there's a special magic in that. And I wish I was one of those three. I've always, I have no musical skills, dancing skills, or artist skills. And I always think, boy, I wish I, I could do that. So maybe in my last chapter of life, I'll learn how to paint a little bit or dance or, or music. Oh, Enrique, someone lied to you because we are all artists. We are all creative. And, you know, my favorite people are the people that come to me or I invite them. And they're like, I can't paint. I can't do a stick figure. And then we get them to do this amazing artwork that is a mural. And then they're hooked. They're like, what? I can do that? That's amazing. I didn't know. So I think that those are lies that were perpetrated on us. When we're children, we are creative and we're willing to try anything. And then there's um, a point in our lives where some teacher or some person tells you, oh, that's not right. That's not, you're, you don't know how to do art. And we believe the lies. And then we grow up with that. But so part of it is kind of how do we shake that off, right? You know, in regards to people coming together, the system is set up so that we don't. The system is set up so we are fragmented. But if we come together, and if we really come together and look at what do we need to work on, right? How do we need to grow and forgive that this is a process? That is a revolution, right? If we can stop the, the colorism, we can stop the discrimination um, and the sexism, sexism in our own community, we're going to be stronger because those things still exist in the Latino community, in the LGBTQI plus community, in the black community. So this is really a time to unify and to look at all of these layers because that's really important for us to do. It's the most important thing, I think. And uh, Dr. Berenice Badillo, that's what you did. That's what you did when you were in school and that counselor said, this is the end of the rope and you took it as a challenge. And now you're a doctor. I love those, the way they did the things with the bird and all that. I'm going to have to learn how to do that. Yeah, I mean, you can. I'm going to do a workshop on it. And it's actually really simple. It is a, um, a file, um, say, say, a, a folder, a manila file folder. It is some scissors, some tape. It's a little skewer and a, um, a straw. And you can make this bird. I'm going to be the one exception. When you say everybody's an artist and a dancer and a musician, you obviously haven't heard me sing, dance, or paint. So you, well, you're going to say, okay, Enrique, but well, you are definitely not that. I'm but, just joking. No, but really, like, so I can't dance and I can't sing. Oh, my God. I, I, my, all my talent was in art. But here's the thing. You don't need to know how to draw to do art. You don't need to know how to do any of those things to do art therapy. And I guarantee you, I can bring you in and you will love the process because it's more about that process. And the thing that we have to learn is not to compare ourselves and also look at the negative things that we say. Like, why do we want to be Picasso? We got to be ourselves. And what we put down our creations are enough and they're important and they're part of us. So I think that's where that therapy component comes from. How do we really look at that? We can't all be Mario Torero, right? You know, we, we are ourselves and we contribute something really important. When somebody says, what is love? How do you describe what is love? Love is a journey because 
we're supposed to come into the world with love that sometimes that doesn't happen or because of different things it doesn't translate into that way and so as we're growing up sometimes it's very painful and sometimes we have these tribulations and so learning how to actually love someone is hard because love requires you to be selfless love requires you to know yourself and love requires you to know others and to listen and love requires you to forgive and to have empathy and these are all very complicated things when we're young uh, and in love we think that that's it but love comes with time and experience and dedication and is always a growth process very well said. One of the things that I've been pla- since I, I'm limited on my art skills, I've been plastering this huh. all around San Diego. All you need is love. And when we were in Tijuana on the other side of the wall, that horrible wall, we took some of these and put them on the wall as well. Because love is what makes the world go round. And that's how we're going to overcome hate, is through love. So, Berenice, you're full of love. Thank you very much for all you do. Muchísimas gracias. Que Dios. Dios te bendiga y que viva la mujer, Chicana Power. Thank you. So, Dr. Berenice Vadillo, you're a magnificent mujer. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for everything that you do, and you're an inspiration. So, on behalf of Gente Unida, thank you for the work that you do, that you're continuing to do. On behalf of Sarah Bella, our producer, myself, Enrique Morones, muchas gracias. Que Dios te bendiga. Y adelante a la luz. Gracias a ti. Thank you. Se me cuidan mucho, ¿ok? Ok. Adiós. Wait, wait, hold on. Bye. <laughs> 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 <laughs>